This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anong, speaking to you from the University of Florida IFIS Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. Aquarium keeping for many hobbyists goes beyond the pet aspect and truly becomes a way to bring aquatic ecosystems into one's home. But how do aquariums affect personal views on science and conservation? My guest today, Dr. Liz Marquillo, longtime aquarist, ichthyologist, and social scientist, currently works for the National Park Service in New Orleans to educate youth in science and ecological restoration and to oversee citizen science programs. Join us as Liz shares her journey and thoughts on how aquarium keeping impacts the future of science and conservation. We'll be right back after these messages. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Dr. Liz Marquillo, youth educator and citizen science coordinator for the John Lafitte Historical National Park and Preserve in New Orleans. Thanks for joining us, Liz. Thanks for having me. Well, you have had quite a amazing kind of life history and a lot of places you've had to travel. I'm going to ask some personal questions info type questions. Let's start with, can you uh, give us some information on your current position and your role at John Lafitte? What do you enjoy the most about it as well? Sure. Yeah. So thanks again for having me and hi to everybody out there in podcast world. So I am a citizen science coordinator at John Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve. Uh, That's a mouthful. So essentially what I do is I do science education and citizen science at the park. Um, Now the park is a the preserve unit of a national park. So the way that works is that there are six different units of this park and I work at the one that's the most wild. So I get to go and give field trips to young students, usually K through 12. And this is to students in the greater New Orleans area. And we specifically look at like Title I schools and try to get underprivileged schools in the very urban areas of New Orleans out to the preserve. So you can go and look at these wild places and get a little bit more attached to their their local place because New Orleans and Louisiana, they're very coastal. And so we want to get those students out there on the coastline to kind of understand, you know, where they live, the impacts of what they do on the environment and the impacts of the environment on how they live their lives. So I do a lot of science education, mainly in wild places right now. And how big is the preserve about uh, it's actually pretty large. It's about 30 miles south uh, from New Orleans. It's, I don't know how many acres it is, multiple thousands of acres. Oh, wow. There are, okay. It's not like Yosemite or Yellowstone. It's not something to that scale. This is more of a, a cultural park. So it's not as big and grandiose as some of the other bigger national parks, but it is a very unique place. So it's, a, I would say, a smaller national park. But it has a, it's a very unique location with a lot of wetlands and alligators and cypress trees and stuff like that. Okay. That well, sounds great. So I had the uh, pleasure of reading your uh, great science article you called uh, My Metamorphosis. Before, before I ask you my first fish question, can you talk a little bit about that dump truck tire tread story? I thought that was, that was a great kind of um, oh, good. getting back. Yep. Yeah, so I got to write a, a short personal essay on basically how I became a scientist. And so when I was a kid, I was an outside kid. I was a tomboy. Um, my favorite things were my little green fish net, which I'm sure all your listeners are familiar with, the little green fish net. 
out on a bucket and a bicycle. And I lived in a neighborhood that had a park with a little creek. And I spent a lot of time collecting creatures in the water. But when I was like 10 or 12 and I was allowed to leave on my bicycle and go explore a little more, I biked out to a construction area where new houses were being built on cleared land. And being the curious tomboy kid, I'm always peeking into little bodies of water to see if there's anything moving around. Because, you know, I always have that net in hand. So I want to go in there and check out and see what's in there. Because it's like Christmas. You never know what you're going to get out of the water. So, you know, 10 or 12 year old with her bicycle pedaling around construction site. You don't usually see that happening today, but this is the 80s. So I'm peeking into puddles and I saw in this construction zone, of course, puddles. And I looked in and I see these little tadpoles just zooming about. And when I was a kid that age, I wasn't so much into fish. I was into tadpoles because it was the metamorphosis that I was really, really, really just intrigued by. Like these little things that live in the water can come out and live on land. So I saw these tadpoles zooming around the warmer water edges, and then they go into the middle. And I knew how to catch them because um, I was watching them go zooming into the middle. So I would put the net up near the edge and catch them. And then what I found was a completely new species, at least to me at my 10 or 12 year old age. This tadpole wasn't just a regular old brown tadpole. Um, It had a red tail. And so I was really, really curious about that and collected some tadpoles, as you do, and took them home to my garage where I let them metamorphose into frogs. And there I was able to confirm that they were Coke's gray tree frogs. And I never really interacted with that species before, so I was really excited. And then I went out to return those baby frogs to their pool because even as a young kid, I knew you you collect animals, you probably should put them back where you collected them. But I found that area had been bulldozed. Obviously, it was in tire tracks, so you think that that would be logical. But as a kid, you don't really realize, you know, where you're catching these things from. And then I went to bring them back, and their their little world wasn't even there anymore. So the story kind of combines, you know, my love for being outside, like how I kind of got into science, and then the conservation aspect where, you know, you're looking at these organisms, and you want to, like, go back and, and do it again, and you can't. So um, so that's the story I shared on in the magazine Science, and it, it's gotten pretty good traction. I think a lot of people resonated with that storyline. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like, like an encapsulation of sort of what's going on, you know, today, unfortunately. But yeah, no, I thought that was a great story. So can you tell us, how, how did you first become interested in fish? You know, how old were you when you started keeping them? What kind of setup did you have? Do you remember what species you had? Sure, of course, you know, I'm on a fish podcast. I got to answer, you know, how do I get <laughs> fish course. on the brain, right? Um, and remembering the story that I just told, you know, it was kind of like tadpoles, but it was really more like aquatic life and the, the curiosity of, you know, there's a wild space and there's stuff in the water. I didn't know what it was. Um, so that's my curiosity is really piqued by being outside, but then I realized that I can bring what's outside inside. And I realized that much later than my very first aquarium, you know, as a kid, my parents had a fish tank. I think everybody in the United States ends up having a fish tank at some time, but sometime in their life, my parents had like a 10 or 20 gallon tank with just the standard run of the milk fish. I remember zebra Danios darting around in there. I did not interact with that aquarium whatsoever. That was my parents thing. So I don't technically say that's my fish tank, but that is the, that is the first time that I have interacted with the fish tank as a child. When I got my driver's license, that was one of the first things I did was me and my brother, my younger brother, we would go and trek to all the different pet stores in the neighborhood or the surrounding area. And so we would drive to local pet stores and I eventually got a 10 gallon tank because 10 gallons is the the tank you get as a kid. And I went to the aquarium store with my brother and I talked the fish the aquarium technician into selling me fish that were completely inappropriate for a 10 gallon tank. (laughs) Because I knew that these fish were going to outgrow this tank. And I knew if he knew what size tank I had, he would not sell me those fish, which he should not have sold me those fish if he knew. But I lied, as a kid does, I suppose. And um, I ended up with Pictus catfish. So I had three Pictus catfish in a 10-gallon aquarium. And so that was one of the most distinctive aquariums I remember as a kid. But then when I grew up a little bit more, I had a 75-gallon aquarium that I earned by working at a pet store. So it was my first job was working at a pet store, and they, of course, give you a discount as an employee. So I got a 75-gallon aquarium. I, would you believe that I had two Oscars and a Jack Dempsey and a Pleco in that aquarium? Nice. Because that's, 
that's how I rolled. It's 75 gallon aquarium with those big fish in there. And I loved it. They were a lot of fun to keep. As a researcher who's looking at hobbyists, I ended up finding out that, you know, like a 10 gallon tank is a pretty standard size aquarium for people to start out with. 75 gallon tank is usually people that have like Oscars or something are keeping them in a 55 gallon aquarium. So those are kind of like the trends that I kind of pulled out from, you know, my experience. Probably my favorite aquarium that I've kept was my 2.5 gallon mini reef aquarium. And this is a, this was a setup that I had wanted to set up for years, having worked at aquarium shops and seeing what other people have done. And then I wanted to just go big or go home. And by big, I mean setting up a teeny tank with a giant sump. So I set up a two and a half gallon display tank. It was a reef tank. And then I had a 10 gallon sump with it, which is pretty big compared to the display tank. So that was probably my very favorite tank. And I had that set up probably a few years ago and I had Recordia Yuma in it and Sexy Shrimp. So I had like little symbiotic relationship with the Sexy Shrimp and the Yuma going on and this teeny little 2.5 gallon aquarium with this big old sump. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I've always wanted to have a sump that, <laughs> that was bigger than the display aquarium just to show that you could do a very small tank display tank, but you know, behind the scenes, you have something else working behind it. So that that's probably my most favorite aquarium that I had set up. That's great. That's great. So, so you mentioned being active with a Columbus area fish enthusiasts. I assume that's what it's called cafe or whatever. Maybe, maybe not. Can you give us some highlights, you know, any, uh, anything you remember and maybe how that group might've shaped who you are today? Oh yeah. So I started working at a fish only aquarium shop and you, you get to know the fish people and they, they had a fish club called cafe and you know, I'm like, that's such a lame name. It's a fish <laughs> club and I'm a female. I'm like, I don't know about this, but um, a lot of the people at the aquarium shop were participating. So I went along with them and a lot of those people ended up being very much like me. They were interested in fish, of course, but a lot of the people I worked with and that met at the, at the club were, some of them were my age, which is not always the trend in aquarium clubs that I've seen. Usually it kind of goes a little bit older, but I was like 20 years old. So there were a fair amount of people that were my age and they were doing aquarium keeping. And I ended up probably the best thing that came from being in the club is becoming friends with those people. Because not only did they support my hobby, so when I had an issue, I can call them up, be like, hey, I'm having this issue, can you help me? Or maybe I would leave and they would watch my fish tank, which is probably one of the number one positive things of having fish friends is that you have someone to take care of your tank that actually understands what's going on with it. And then I also ended up just making lifelong friends. It's really strange that I have friends now that I remember being in this fish club with. And so... The club atmosphere for me was like not just about the fish. It was a social thing too. It made me a better fish keeper. And I'm a big proponent of clubs now because I know how much it can really help out, especially like the newcomers to the hobby. And I'm 100% positive that I became an ichthyologist because I kept fish in captivity. So you never know what kind of benefits you're going to get from being in a fish club and being supported by other people. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I, I was pretty active with, with the Tampa Bay Aquarium Society when I moved down here, and I'm still friends with a lot of those guys. So shout out to uh, Tampa Bay Aquarium Society. So I know you ended up, I guess you ended up selling fish and, and coral and everything too. How did that happen? Yeah, so one of the things that I kind of reflect on as a, a researcher person who's looking at the aquarium hobby is like, you know, why did I do the things that I did? So I was breeding and propagating fish and coral, you know, to kind of make my hobby keep going. It was funding my hobby for one, uh, because I wasn't making a lot of money as a student at the time. But the reason I got into doing that is because, well, I needed some other challenge, essentially, in the hobby. Because the first challenge, at least to me, is keeping the fish alive, or the plants alive, or the coral alive. Once you keep all those things alive, then what's the next thing you're going to do? You're going to find something else to do to keep you engaged in the hobby. So for me, it was experimenting with other species. So, you know, maybe I was keeping pelagic spawning fish like zebra danios or something where you have to raise the babies up if they breed. That's too much work for me. So when I was starting out, I was keeping cichlids and I'm like, this is where it's at. These fish will breed as long as I take good care of them, which I was at the point. And they take on all the responsibility for taking care of the babies. 
So I'm like, this is great. Uh, I get to keep the fish. They're healthy and happy. They're breeding. They're happy with me as a fish keeper because they're breeding. I get to watch the babies grow up. I don't have to take care of the babies nearly as much as I would for a, a different species of fish, a different taxa. And then once I really broke my teeth on breeding cichlids, it was on. I could breed just about anything because I understood what was going on with the organism. I understood like what size food they even needed, even though I wasn't feeding them as much as I would need to for some other species. I still understood all those small little minutia driven steps to breed fish. And I started breeding plants as well, the propagating plants, mainly because our club had the BAP and HAP programs and I'm a competitive person. So I wanted to get some points. Um, I never actually was all that great at the BAP or HAP programs, but it was still challenging. Again, found a challenge. And for coral, for propagation wise, I found it just really interesting that you could asexually propagate a coral. You have a little fragment and you can just break off a teeny little polyp even, and it grows into something else. So the propagation was finding something more challenging in the hobby, but it was also, you know, giving back in a way, keeping myself entertained and then just, yeah, looking for something to challenge my, I think really just the challenge itself is uh, the core basis. So transitioning, so to speak from, uh, from your hobby to science, you mentioned in that article we, we talked about a little bit earlier, you had two really strong mentors, Dr. Meg Daly and Dr. John Wenzel from Ohio State. Can you tell us how they influenced you? Yeah, sure. So I'm a first generation college student. And when I went to college, my first year out of high school, I ended up dropping out because I didn't understand anything about how it worked. Um, I tried to play soccer my first year, ended up dropping out. And I finally went back to school after working at an aquarium store for four years during that dropout period. So I had went to school, dropped out, got really crazy into fish, and then went back to school. And when you go back to college as an older student, especially at a big university like Ohio State, the students who are the traditional students who go in right after high school, they make their own social world, their own social unit. So you have freshmen, they're all together, they are freshmen, they are the class of whatever it is. I wasn't in that. And so for me, I felt like not a part of the university, not a part of the learning experience. I was an outcast. And I also had to, to work to make ends meet. And a lot of students that I was you know, in classes with didn't have a job. So I ended up getting a job at the Museum of Biological Diversity at Ohio State just to, you know, have a job. And I was at a biological museum. So, hey, I like animals. Those, those animals are all dead, but I still like them. <laughs> um, but Dr. Wenzel and Dr. Daly both worked at the museum. And so I just kind of infiltrated their group and tried to participate as much as possible, tried to do good work. And they um, ended up giving me a lot of really good life advice. And so um, Dr. Wenzel like, uh, supported me. He actually knew me from one of the aquarium stores I work for. So he knew I was a fish person. And he suggested, hey, go to graduate school, study fish. Not many people are interested in fish compared to what the other species I was interested in, which would be like birds. Too many ornithologists, not enough ichthyologists, especially females, go for that. So he helped me apply for grad school, um, and go that route. Cause I didn't even know what grad school was. It didn't, I had no clue again, first year college student. And Dr. Daly also gave me some like life support, you know, just being like the outcast, non-traditional student, you know, having somebody there that cares for you and like supports you through all the hardship, whether they understand that it's a hardship to you or not, just having them there was super important to me. And I remember telling them it was super important and they, they didn't even really realize it, but they really appreciated knowing. No, oh, that is great. Yeah. Good mentors and, and kind of role models are really important. So uh, before we take a break, uh, one last kind of sort of historical question. Can you share sort of your transition from natural sciences? And, and I guess you did your master's at Southeast Louisiana University to social science, uh, which you took up over at Texas A&M. Can you maybe briefly touch on that transition? Ah, I don't know how brief I can make it. Um, <laughs> no problem. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So practically speaking, the change from natural science to social science was not as hard as it could have been because I did it right after my first year at a and And it was challenging because advisors don't want to take on new students, especially some that are leaving other 
people's labs, but I had funding. So I was able to get into someone else's research lab without much of an issue. But that transition wasn't necessarily all that fun to deal with. But the reason I transitioned from natural science to social science was because I became more interested in the reasoning I became an ichthyologist. So I have a master's in biological sciences, which is specifically in fish. So I'm technically an ichthyologist at the master's degree level. And so when I went to a and to continue being an ichthyologist, I became more interested in why I became an ichthyologist. So what, what parts of my life, you know, made, informed me into someone who was interested in fish, especially being a woman. And there are not many women ichthyologists. So what was going on in my, in my past that, that formed me into going the, the route that I went. And so what I became interested in is actually studying that, that route and using my own history as a, as a way to inform that. And so when I started in the social sciences, what I was interested in is the progression of a scientist from like a novice type person, you know, keeping a fish tank to an ichthyologist, to a professional who's getting paid to, to do specifically just fish stuff. So that's the transition where I became more interested, not, I wasn't as interested in the fish, I was more interested in the humans and you know, what made them interested in the fish. Thanks. That was a great kind of summary. So let's take a short break. We'll continue our discussion with Dr. Liz Marquillo, Aquarius social scientist, ichthyologist, and educator after these messages from our sponsors. So now I've got this pack of four Sharpe rescue dogs, Jimmy, Coco, another Sharpe, one pug, who is Joe. I have stuck with the Dynavite for, oh my goodness, probably five, six years. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. People remark on really how well my dogs look, what beautiful coats they've got. I tell them, yep, they get a regular diet of Dynavite with every meal. Dynavite is nutrition. All I have to do is say dog food. It's a pandemonium. They can be half asleep. And they're up and thrilled. She just looks that whole squeaky clean. You don't need to wait until a problem presents itself. It's far better to keep the dog happy and healthy at all times. Dynavite for life. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. People do ask how they get Dynavite. I tell them I get my Dynavite from D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. We're back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Dr. Liz Marquillo. So you definitely had, you know, you, you had quite a lot of experience in the hobby on, you know, all, all different aspects of it. So let's talk a little bit about the social science aspect of it now. Tell us a little bit about your experiences, I guess maybe with um, with Masna and how Masna helped you in your research. And then we'll talk about some of the questions that you were kind of looking into. Sure. So Masna is the Marine Aquarium Societies of North America. I'm guessing you're, everyone knows that in your podcast, but um, they also have a scholarship program. So this big national group has a very large scholarship that they give out to young researchers, whether they be undergraduates or graduates. And I was a graduate student working on trying, really forming this research program. And I heard about the Masna scholarship, so I applied. And they ended up giving me the scholarship. I think it was because of that integration of the natural sciences, because I knew a lot about fish, and then that social science aspect, which really like linked nicely into it especially that I knew about the fish and aquarium keeping. So I was a, a very well-informed researcher going into research that stuff. A lot of times people who do research don't really know anything about what they're researching, which is not a negative. It's just, I was very well prepared for this particular research avenue of inquiry. So I think that's why they gave me the money. So I got this scholarship and that it was $4,000. And I'd like to thank, I think it was Tunzi. Oh, I forget the, the rest of the, the supporters for the scholarship. Live Aquaria was one, and I think Triton was also the, the third one. Anyway, I wanted to thank those people because without that, my research would not even be possible. I was able to travel to the, the MACNA conferences. So MASNA puts on the big conferences each year. So I was able to travel to two different ones 
and interview Aquarius for my research. So without that scholarship, I would not be able to have done the research that I did. So I'm very happy to have been able to get that scholarship. And the nice thing too about being involved with MASNA, as I said, it's a social group of like-minded fish people who are doing aquarium hobbyist stuff that they've been super supportive of me and they allowed me to study their own people essentially. So when I got in the scholarship, I got in the okay from the president of, of MACNA to actually go into the, the different conferences, those two conferences and, and do research on people who are there. Of course, I'd ask them for their permission and all that. So there's like kind of a two-tiered aspect where getting the scholarship not only gave me money to be able to travel, but it gave me the connections in order to be able to complete the, the research project. So you had to wear like camouflage when you went into their native habitat to make sure that it, you... <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I stuck out like a sore thumb. Any, sorry to say it so bluntly, but any woman that goes to a MACNA conference <laughs> is going to be noticed. There's a lot of dudes, which is you know fine, but... You know, if there's a, a female walking around, especially one that kn- knows what they're talking about, asks open-ended questions, it, it usually gets a lot of attention. <laughs> well, I will have to say the more recent ones are having more females, so that's good. <laughs> oh, that's great to hear. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's go to the, to the questions then. And I know there's obviously a lot of important questions out there. Which ones were most important to you and, and what sort of things were you looking to try to answer? So... I was really interested in the in the progression of, of hobbyists. So you go into a hobby knowing zero. You keep killing all the fish that you, you, you buy. I mean, you're a murderer for a very long period of time sometimes. And then all of a sudden, you are able to keep this fish alive. So what happens there? You know, how do people go from a fish murderer to a fish keeper? So that's one of the things I was interested in. Like, what's going on in that teeny little phase of aquarium keeping? But then also on a longer scale, like how do these people who are, are keeping Aquaria find their little niche, their little niche, like where they, they like to uh, participate. So I was interested in like how people are participating, uh, what they're learning along the way. And then I was really especially interested in teasing out the scientific part of that. And by scientific part, I mean like what are people doing in the hobby that has something to do with a scientific aspect, whether it be learning facts uh, about science or organisms or, you know, the physics of light, water chemistry, that's science. Uh, It could be the scientific method where you are doing the same thing over and over and killing fish. And then you're like, okay, I need to go back and look at how I'm doing my hobby. And sometimes people are actually using the scientific method in order to, to correct all those, those fish keeping errors. And so I was able to kind of start teasing out the scientific aspect of fish keeping. So when people are keeping fish and they kill them, you know, when they stop killing them, they're actually learning about the nitrogen cycle. They learn that the fish waste accumulates and it kills the fish off. But, you know, you need to basically grow bacteria in your aquarium in order to break down the fish waste. So that in and of itself is scientific, the nitrogen cycle, growing bacteria is kind of a science. Um, So even just that one teeny hurdle of getting from fish murderer to fish keeper involves science. So my main questions were like the infiltration of science into the aquarium hobby. You know, what aspects of science kind of are throughout? How do people progress through the activity of aquarium keeping? And do they naturally kind of progress to like a scientific orientation at the end? So those are kind of the key underlying research questions. And I didn't 100% answer all of those, but those questions are, are starting to be answered. So that's always a good start. Yeah, definitely. And I think just the fact that you start asking those, you know, and, and start looking into it is important because obviously we want to make sure people are as educated as possible in the hobby as well as a side benefit. So, you know, me, myself being a non-sociologist, can you explain how you approach the uh, these types of questions? You know, what, what kind of methods do you use? How, how do you uh, get that information? Sure. Well, I mean, I can't blame you for not understanding because I didn't understand either being a natural scientist, studying fish, going into the social sciences. So for your listeners, when you think social science, think studying people. Specifically, the social science I was interested in using is one that looks at the attitudes and the behaviors of of the people who are doing a leisure activity. And so that section of social science is often called human dimensions. The human dimensions are the attitudes and behaviors that someone brings to the table when they are 
participating in some activity. People who study human dimensions can study something like recreational boating. What do people get out of that activity? So I was interested in using the human dimensions, the attitudes and behaviors of these people in order to understand the scientific aspects that they're learning about and if they are learning anything about science. So one of the first things I had to do is define what a scientific attitude and behavior even was. And those are rather rudimentary. So scientific behavior might be something like testing water. You know, if you're a scientist looking at the behavior, you're like, that is not a scientific behavior. But in a very rudimentary novice type beginnings of a scientist, yes, it is definitely a scientific behavior. Yeah. So so some of those things that like these scientific attitudes and behaviors, I had to define in order to even communicate with researchers because as Aquarists, I think a lot of us, and I'm putting myself as an Aquarius when I say we, a lot of us think and do things scientifically without even realizing it. So some of the things that I really had to do, like you said, like wear camouflage and watch people and see what they're doing. And I really had to make a lot of notes, write a lot of things down, look at things and look at the context that they're in. So the social science gets a lot of poo-poo from natural scientists because it is a little bit more subjective. Because when you ask people questions, and I did ask people questions, one of the methods I used was interviewing. People know what you're asking. So you can either ask some questions that are completely straightforward and go behind the scenes, or you can ask them questions that you know they're going to lie about and just let them lie. Because a lot of the stuff I'm interested in, too, is conservation. And many Aquarists know that aquarium keeping is not a conservation-based activity. We don't necessarily give back as much as we take from the wild organisms. So asking someone point blank about conservation is just not going to elicit any information about... It might elicit some information, but it's not going to give you the same type of information that it could um, if I just ask a basic question and kind of go behind the scenes or go behind the scenes, period. So one of the things I also did at MACNA was I went into the vendor hall for several hours and just looked at the um, the rhetoric, which would be like what people are saying on the signage, on the flyers. And I wanted to see like, is there conservation wording being integrated into you know what people are telling other Aquarists? And so that's like the kind of behind the scenes things I had to do, which is, like I said, a little bit more on the subjective side, because it's up to me to say, OK, this is conservation based information that they're giving out. This is science based information that they're giving out. And so the types of approaches I had to use were a, someone on the covert side, just because I had to really dig in and see what people were really meaning behind their actions. So it was a little bit challenging in that way. And, I, you know, I felt a little dirty in some ways just because you know, <laughs> people were saying things and I'm like, okay, I'm writing down what you're saying. But then I had to go back and like actually contextualize it and like give it a little bit more of like, this is what they actually meant behind it. And uh, it was, it's just, it's a lot of responsibility being a social scientist. There's a lot of ethics involved. And so it took me a very long period of time to actually get the research done. It took seven years. So, you know, a lot of that has to do with the types of questions I was asking and then the methods. Like I said, I looked at content, I did interviews with Aquarius, and I did also participate as an Aquarius myself. So those are the methods that I use. I hope, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it does. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I, I definitely respect social sciences. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of things we're learning about ourselves and a lot of different areas. So yeah. And I understand how difficult it could be, <laughs> or at least I think I do. So no, I appreciate that. So what were some of the major findings in your work and how do you think these can potentially be applied, you know, to better the hobby science and, and society? Well, for one, science can be done as a leisure activity. That's one of the key findings. That's not a finding, really. It's really just a regurgitation of what people already know. Science didn't start as a profession. It started as a leisure activity. So me saying science can be done as a leisure activity, it's kind of like a duh statement. But sometimes you just need to be told that in order to understand it. So for one, science can be done as a leisure activity, even still now, even though science is a profession. And the aquarium hobby seems to be an activity that involves science to even have success at the activity itself. 
So that's one of the key findings is that science knowledge and science behavior are necessary for aquarium keeping, period. You can't keep a fish alive unless you understand the nitrogen cycle. That's pretty easy to understand. Nitrogen cycle is scientific and that's how you keep the fish alive. I mean, that's just step one. The aquarium hobby also has scientific parts infiltrated into it. For one, when people are finding their niches, their areas of the hobby that they really enjoy, a lot of those niches are scientific ones. So when I was at MACNA, I noticed that there are different specialists. You got people who are specialists in like water quality. You can send your water. Now you can send your water off through the mail to get a very expert lead done water quality test. And those people who are doing those tests found their niche. They were aquarists who really enjoyed water quality testing. So now they have a, they have a business behind it. Other people who find niches in the hobby do maybe coral propagation and they enjoy that activity for many different reasons. I could name several. I don't want to put words in people's mouths though, but for whatever reason, people enjoy propagating corals and that ends up being a scientific activity. Now, one of the things that we can strive for, for the betterment of the hobby and science and society is to do a better job of documenting all that stuff. So if you're propagating something that has never been propagated before, it would be very useful to write all of the information down that got you to that point. And BAP and HAP in the freshwater realm, they often require people who are doing that type of like breeding activity to document everything that has to go on in order for the organism to propagate themselves or for you to propagate them. And then that information is actually scientific information so that people can replicate that. So what we need to do, in my opinion, what the marine aquarium hobby needs to do a little bit better job of, of all these advancements that are that hobbyists are making, these non-scientific people are making, we need to make it better known so that outsiders know that the hobby is actually a benefit to society. It's giving back to science. It's giving us new information that's not been capable of finding before because people just have leisure time. They can enjoy themselves and breed things that scientists don't have time or money to do themselves. So documenting, you know, all these beneficial things that the hobby is doing, I think is one of the number one things that we should strive for as a, as a hobby, because it, it really benefits us as, as a hobby activity, because uh, there are other issues that are come up in the hobby, which I believe you're going to ask me about that. If, we can lay the foundation and say the hobby is a good thing, then all the detrimental things that come with a wildlife oriented hobby can kind of be mitigated. So, so one of the, some of the key things, the key findings is the infiltration of, of science throughout the hobby. It's used to even be a success in the hobby. And then all these other little issues that kind of stem from just being a hobby that has the use of wildlife in it. So I guess, uh, and here's kind of maybe a side question. Obviously, there's a lot of attempts to try to do this. Do you have any thoughts on how to make the science part interesting to the beginners so that it's not a burden and they have more success early on? You know, that's that's been a challenge, I think, for a long time. Any, any thoughts based on all the things you've been through, both as a hobbyist as well as a scientist? To have success earlier? and uh, for Yeah, a, yeah. Because a lot of people, you know, even, you know, with a little bit of a little information on water quality, they still don't get it and, and they don't. Some of them still don't want to kind of go through the the actual understanding sure. of it, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, I thought a fair amount of this because I'm a I'm an aquarist at heart. You know, I started out aquarium keeping before sciencing, I guess. So I want the aquarium hobby to keep going, and I think one of the main things to keep hobbyists in the hobby, especially new people, aquarium clubs, social groups, getting people with other people. Now I know this is a terrible thing to even like bring up now that we're social distancing but even just online forums can be a huge benefit to new people so getting newcomers to understand that they are not alone in this endeavor and that they can have other people around to tell them maybe not tell them what to do but at least give them some advice is going to be completely beneficial now that does come with negatives there's always people that are saying that they know the best they know what they're doing and so sometimes newcomers listen to the wrong person. So that could be an issue. And also, I think newcomers too, and this will help with that issue too, is that they need to understand that they are completely responsible for what happens in the aquarium. That these organisms are not all just captive bred organisms, that some of them are actually wildlife. 
So they are responsible for the lives of these organisms. Now, that is not exactly fun to talk about. And maybe if we fix all the other issues that promote the dropout of people, we don't necessarily need to like punch them in the face. Like, this is wildlife. You need to be responsible. But there are some responsibility aspects that aquarium hobbyists just need to know because sometimes they're like, oh, well, Fred, my whatever frog or whatever organism they're keeping that they really, really love in their aquarium and they can't keep anymore. What do they do? They chuck it outside because they want to set it free. So that's an invasive species concern as well. So we have to really juggle as aquarium hobbyists, like giving people enough information about what they're responsible for, maintaining the fun and also maintaining their participation in the hobby. So all those things, are just it's a little complicated, but the viability of the aquarium hobby, it just really relies on all of those. Right. No, great points. So I, I think we might have at some point, or maybe in articles, talked about millennials and all these new generations. No, I can't keep track anymore. Do you have any, uh, <laughs> anything implication-wise for what you did with regard to these kind of more urban generations? You know, any, any sort of thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a millennial. I'm an old millennial, 1982. So I'm barely on the cusp, but, and I got my first email address when I was 14. I distinctly remember it. It was like magic being able to use email. <laughs> <laughs> it was magical. But luckily as a kid, I was an outdoor kid first. Now we have different generation, older, gen- I guess they're younger generations now, younger than millennials that have email much sooner in their lives and computers and sooner in their lives. And phones sooner in their lives. All these things are happening much sooner in their lives and that they are becoming indoor kids. So I see a dichotomy where there's outdoor kids and there's indoor kids. And maybe that's generational. I think there's more indoor kids with the younger generations because, you know, being outside is scary now. Um, (laughs) Some parents even get in trouble when they leave their kids, let their kids go to the park to play. So there's a lot more indoor kids now. And so that is problematic because the outdoors is where all the organisms are. They're not inside unless we bring them in there. Well, then there's the um, ones you really don't want to talk about that are inside, you know, like. The- <laughs> <laughs> Very true. But yeah, so the, the work I do now involves getting like urban youth and, uh, you know, one of these great American cities out into these wild spaces. And a lot of these kids have never, ever been to the swamp. And we live in a swamp. So it's really just, it's mind boggling that, that type of change has happened within my, within my life. But I think that there's, there's just an issue with indoor and outdoor. It may not be necessarily generational, but I think that younger kids, they just need to go outside more, especially if we want to build up budding scientists, because I haven't done the research to show that indoor kids don't become scientists, but they become, I'm sure they become different flavor scientists. Like maybe they're lab scientists and not field scientists. So I just think that, you know, my work is trying to get, you know, kids outside more, essentially. They're trying to get kids to understand that outside is not a bad place. And that's where, you know, the things that are inside come from that you're interested in. You just have to go to them instead of them coming to you. Oh, that's great. Well, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Did you have any final words of wisdom or thoughts for our listeners? I guess final words of wisdom is that I don't think people should underestimate hobbies as an extension of a profession. So while, you know, aquarium hobbyists just seem like weirdos with tanks in their basement, (laughs) they're not just weirdos with basement (laughs) tanks full of fish. They are people who are doing things that could potentially be very positive for the organisms that they're keeping. And these hobbies not only, you know, give back to society, they actually make our lives better and more fulfilling. We find challenges in them. We overcome challenges in them. So just like the benefits of having a a leisure activity, whether it's an aquarium hobby or not, I think is a a very good, a good thing to have in your life. And if it's science-based, great. I think that we definitely need more science knowledgeable scientific people in the world who can critically think and analyze on their own. So I think my final words of wisdom would be like, don't underestimate hobbies as extensions of professions. Aquarium hobbyists do scientific things every single time they interact with their aquarium. And I don't think scientists should ever underestimate that. Great. Love that. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Liz Marquio, and our producer, Mark Winter, for making the show possible. Thanks again, Liz, for joining us. 
Thank you so much for having me. I hope it was interesting. That was great. Great. You had a lot of great insights. Really appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at drroy at petliferadio.com. That's D-R-R-O-Y at petliferadio.com. Until next time, please visit your local aquarium stores and keep your tanks clean and your fish healthy. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.